Got it, lovely. Um, so hello and welcome to my talk, Woods, Walls and the Wilderness, Werewolves and the Eco-Gothic. I apologize for it originally having quite a dry Werewolves and the Eco-Gothic, um, but it was very much a situation where like Sam asked me and I was like, oh, what am I gonna talk about? So I just threw the first thing out. Um, so there's a bit of information there. Um, so I'm Dr. Kaya Frank. I have my email there, which is k.frank2 at hearts.acuk. So that's the university I'm based at. And then I've also got my Twitter, which is at Kaya Frank. Um, below that, in parentheses, I have three other Twitter <laughs> um, handles in case you want to follow any of the other things I do. Um, so first it's at Ogon Project, which is the larger research project, which amongst other things funded um, or offered me a studentship for my PhD, which is where this, this research comes from. Uh, then I've got at Dance Gothic. Gothic, um, which is my more recent research project. It's a little baby one. It's just coming out. It's just like a, it's in a fetal stage. It's very exciting. It's it's just that nerve wracking thing where you don't know where it's going to go. Um, and that's with uh, Kate Harvey, who I believe is in the room today, um, and also um, Karen Graham as well. Um, and that's about Gothic dance, but in particular Gothic ballet and ballet Gothic. And finally, if you're like, wow, what I really want to learn about is pedagogy and particularly the scholarship of teaching and learning, uh, then you can follow me on at Impactful Subtle. And that is an open group where we have regular meetings um, about basically the scholarship of teaching and learning, but in a really sort of hands on way. With that in mind, this talk, um, it is a teaching talk. Um, but I'm hoping that I've got it the right level. So I have in the chat put two documents. One is the bibliography for this, and two is the table of werewolves. So the bibliography isn't just the text that I'm going to be quoting on, on my slides. It is actually far broader in terms of a reading list around um, werewolves, uh, wolves, and a few other things. Um, so hopefully that's useful. So if you feel that this talk is just quite lightweight, it's not as academic as you'd like, then go to that reading list and you'll be able to find as many academic paper, um, talks as you want about, um, yeah, about werewolves. Uh, the other thing is the table of werewolves is something I created for my thesis. So it's not entirely up to date. I think it stops around 2016. And that's basically a list of um, all of the texts that I read that were werewolf texts. And then frontal codes, like how they transform, do they do a full transformation, as well as a little overview of each of the texts. So if you are wanting to do some, that's all fiction. If you are wanting to read some more, um, then that's where you can go for fictional texts as well. It is 40 pages, I warn you. It is a massive document, um, but it's quite nicely laid out. So hopefully people find that useful. What I wanted to do in the talk is in some ways look a little bit at methodology. And you're probably like, woohoo, yay, methodology. It's my favorite thing. Um, and the reason why I want to talk about this is because I've been revisiting my thesis, partly to write a book proposal to turn it into a monograph, but also because I was invited on a podcast to talk about my research. And I particularly ended up talking about the, the early aspects of doing a PhD. Um, and what it was like when I started and I felt that I didn't really have a clear idea um, of how I was going to approach my task. So in some ways, this talk is about Wales and Eco Gothic, but it's also kind of about research process. And hopefully some of you who may be at the beginning of a research process will find this useful. Or if you're just thinking about research more broadly, you may find it useful. So the first thing to say is, well, what is a werewolf? We're going to look at what is a werewolf, what is a wolf, and then how do the two combine? And then we'll have a brief perusal of eco-gothic and some of the terms around there. And it might seem obvious to know what a werewolf is, but I found that the best thing you can do right at the beginning of any research project is write the obvious. Because a lot of what's in the obvious are the things that we take for granted, and they are the things that are actually worth maybe analysing a little bit. How did we get here? So this bullet point is, uh, these bullet points come from very scientific methods that I used, where I went to the bar after work with all my colleagues, and I asked them all, now these are not academics, and these are not monster specialists, I asked them all to tell me the key defining features of a werewolf, and I then wrote those down on a bit of paper and took it home with me. So 
highly recommend it. I'm sure that would come up to rigorous like peer review um, if I was to do it. But it was really useful because what I wanted to understand was in general, what do people think a werewolf is? If you want a better definition, I'd uh, recommend Jeffrey Weinstock's definition in the uh, an Encyclopedia of Monsters. Um, and he really goes through it in a, in a more coherent way. But let's just go from what my mate said whilst we were having a chat. So firstly, they confirmed it was a monster. It was one of the big three monsters. You've got Frankenstein's monster, you've got vampires, you've got werewolves. It transforms, and this is important, it transforms physically. So you are gonna get some texts, werewolf texts, and increasingly you see them um, really from the 20th century onwards, where it's not entirely clear whether this person is actually transforming physically or whether they are having a break from reality in some way. Um, and I will in, in some ways include the many people I found who uh, believe that they are shapeshifters online um, and they couldn't provide me evidence that they were physically transforming. So unfortunately, I didn't think they held up to my rigorous standards. Um, the other thing was they always transformed into something that was quite a sexy animal, like a snow leopard or something. Whereas if I'm honest, I'm clearly a wear slug because all I want to do is lie and move slowly and be covered in primordial slime. Um, I, I don't think I'm anything cool like a snow leopard. So they transform physically once a month due to the full moon. And again, you're probably all going, it's not an absolute, but by the standards of pop culture, people were definitely sure that the full moon played a part. And it is a full moon tonight, if you were wondering. This is very well timed. Um, so feel free to go and howl at the moon if you want. So that notion of the full moon um, and that relationship really comes and is cemented in the early 20th century, particularly in films. So I would say werewolves, as we understand them, are our creatures of the silver screen. They're man eaters, hence they're monsters. They're aggressive, they're fast and they're strong. So they're physically superior uh, to humans. That's why they can kill us. That you become a werewolf because you get bitten. Obviously, if you are familiar with more folkloric interpretation, of werewolves you're probably thinking well you can also render baby fat and make a balm to transform yourself into a werewolf or wear a girdle of human skin or make a deal with the devil um, and these are things that do come up in significantly earlier representations and have been picked up again in some literature but as a general rule of thumb this idea of transference through bite is important and finally how do you kill a werewolf we all know it's by a silver bullet so that's how you kill a werewolf so that was what I was going on in terms of what is a werewolf. And then I wanted to unpack some of that. And particularly, I wanted to think about why are they a monster? And again, it seems obvious, they're scary, they're bigger than me, they can kill me and they're uncontrolled. Of course, they're a monster. But I wanted to think about why we find that scary and particularly how that relates to wolves. So let's have a little look at the history of the werewolf. That's the next good thing to do if you are doing some research. Where does it all come from? I won't get too involved in the etymology of the word werewolf because it's not my area of specialism, but there's some really good, um, there's some really interesting work online about that. But broadly speaking, as you can guess from the phrase werewolf, it's Germanic, um, so werewolf. So some of the places that we can find the history of werewolves is in the werewolf trials. And I've got a few of the key ones there, Pierre Bougot and Michel Verdun, Peter Stubb and Jean Grenier there. And um, so we've got, Bourgogne, Verdun and Grenier are French and Stubb is uh, the Welf Bedberg, so he's German. And these are cases of people who are accused of turning into a wolf with the help of the devil, uh, committing atrocious acts, particularly cannibalism, um, and in the case of Stubb, uh, incest as well. Um, and then they, in some cases, were put to death. And in other cases, like uh, Jean Grenier, he was actually found to be, um, well, it's quite interesting by the sounds of the time, he was found to be mentally unfit to stand trial properly. And so they just went, we're going to put you uh, to go and live with some monks. And that's how he lived the rest of his life out. We then have tales like the Beast of Jovidin. Um, I know I've destroyed that pronunciation, apologies. And that was a monstrous wolf. And some of the ideas, so it's a monstrous wolf, it's from um, France, at a time when there was a significant number of wolf hunters, where a lot of the economy of France was still based in sheep. So you didn't really want a wolf coming along killing sheep, but you also didn't want a wolf coming along and killing people as well. Um, 
And this monstrous wolf, if you look at how it's reported, it moves from being a large wolf, a natural large wolf, to moving into being some, somehow um, supernatural in some way. So it gets this overlap of this preternatural lycanthropic quality. The other thing to mention is that there's no British werewolves. Um, and I don't mean something like an American werewolf in London, but I mean that there's very limited um, werewolf um, folklore within Britain. We have a lot of black dogs. We get lots of black dogs, but we don't get many werewolves. And that's in part because of the destruction of the wolf population. It starts with England, Wales, um, and then Ireland and Scotland. And so there's no real animal to imprint on um, this fear of the wolf. Now, what I think is particularly interesting is how we get from these true crime accounts of the werewolf trials, true accounts that, that appear to be a large wolf that was preying on people uh, with the beast of Jevedin. But then how do we get to the fact that it becomes story or fiction? And I think Scanduto, Scanduto here really analyzes one of the key moments. And that's when a pamphlet of the crimes of Peter Stubb is translated into English very quickly. By the end of the 1500s, we've got this pamphlet about the crimes of the supposed werewolf being translated into English and it's then being in, um, sort of um, reproduced around London and people are reading it. Um, and what Scanduto does is suggest that this is really where metamorphosis thus becomes metaphor. Or we start going from werewolves are this scary true crime phenomenon to werewolves are fun and could be stories. And that's particularly, I think, particularly important because we're going to come back to that idea of how metaphor relates to the wolf. Which leads to the very next question. So what is a wolf? Again, seems obvious. I know what a wolf is. It's Canis lupus. We've all heard of the wolf. But actually, when we look at wolves or we talk about wolves, we're very rarely talking about wolves. And there are lots of things that wolves have come to represent. And I got a few examples here. We might think about how wolves are also used metaphorically, much like werewolves. So we have um, this is really recent. This is from a news report that just says the threat is real. Lone wolf danger on the rise. Um, and. Essentially, it's talking about uh, domestic terrorism in America um, and using the phrase lone wolf. And if you just go online now, point to Google or your preferred search engine, lone wolf, and click on the news, you will just get hit after hit after hit after hit in which lone wolves are particularly related to acts of terrorism. So this is a way that we're, you know, we're already starting to metaphorically engage with the wolf. We might think about the wolf whistle. I've got a little picture of a wolf whistle down there. We may think, again, how we use wolves as another way to represent the worst of human behavior. And here there's an advert, the woman, there's an, uh, a woman and she's holding on to a pole, um, but she looks like she's on the metro in Paris, but actually she's in a forest and there are two wolves coming towards her. Um, and this advert is was released um, by the Paris Metro to talk about sexual harassment and why you shouldn't do it. What I find particularly interesting is that they chose animals to represent who those sexual harassers were. And in this case, they choose wolves. So wolves are related to rapacious male violence and sexual violence. And that jumps over to the pitch on the side, which is the Gustave Doré um, illustration of Little Red Riding Hood with a big bad wolf. So we've all heard of the big bad wolf. And of course the big bad wolf is the creature of our nightmares, the creature of fairy tales. Um, and in many of the um, versions, particularly I'm thinking of Charles Perrault's version, it's very explicitly a metaphor for male behavior and male sexual violence. So let's go to a little bit more um, of some of the other attitudes. I've got, this is a picture of the hangover. So these are the three central characters from The Hangover. And it says the wolf pack is back on it. So wolf pack and wolf behavior has also been reclaimed as sort of a positive thing. 
Um, so the idea that like you want to be a wolf pack, you don't want to be a lone wolf, you want to be surrounded and particularly again a masculine thing. And I'm thinking as well of how the terms and I'm sure we're all familiar with this. The terms alpha, beta and omega have been co-opted by men's rights activists, particularly incels and so forth, to talk about um, essentially human behavior. And I'm sure all of you have heard people talking about like alpha, beta. Good news is, chaps, if anyone starts saying that to you, you can remind them that the wolf biologist who came up with that hierarchical model of wolf behavior has completely disavowed it, has said that he was using examples of wolves who are in captivity, and there is no evidence that wolves have hierarchical behavior like that. Um, and actually they have family units. So generally family units are how they work. If there is a lone wolf, they're not gonna be having a happy time. They may be sick with something like rabies, but they need to be part of a pack. Um, so I find this, this quite, I always like telling people that because I'm constantly being told about people's relationship with their dogs where they have to tell me that they're the alpha of the pack. And I'm like, right, okay, well, that's not true though, is it? And then they explain to me how it definitely applies to dogs. And I'm like, okay, fine. Um, my uncle does that quite a lot. The other two I, um, images or three images is more to do with environmental concerns around wolves. So we've got a wolf, um, a silhouette of a wolf in a um, what looks like a target. And that is actually a decal that was on a uh, that you could buy as a sticker. You could put it onto your car um, and it was produced um, at a time and in an area in uh, the United States of America where there was a lot of debates about hunting wolves. Um, so wolves have gone from being these creatures that we fear and that you rightly need to hunt to being creatures that have perhaps been put on a pedestal in some ways. Um, I, the image where it says how wolves change rivers, and that's from a, uh, you can find it on YouTube, a short documentary, there's a longer version, about um, the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone Park and how doing so affected the way that rivers ran because it impacted the predation on deer and they were then eating the trees. And this is part of the movement of seeing wolves as these right, beautiful symbols of the wilderness. Um, and that's also something that's picked up on the T-shirt. The final image I want to talk to, um, I'm sure we've all seen T-shirts in the style. It's got three very romanticized pictures of wolves and it's got a moon. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this imagery is a co-opting or appropriation of Native American beliefs regarding um, wolves. Um, but yeah, it, it's seen as a little bit maybe, I mean, it's basically my T-shirt that I'm wearing. Um, it's seen as perhaps a little bit tacky nowadays, um, but certainly that's something that you can see that imagery. And again, that's sort of a fantasy wolf the magical wolf, the elements of the wolf and the wilderness and nature. So we had a wolf and now we have more than a wolf. Or to quote Marvin, this is such a good book. It's part of the reaction series on animals. Um, and I think his book on, on the wolf is great. And what he says is the wolf is a creature of human, moral, social, economic, political, aesthetic and emotional concerns and projections which I think I've made explicit through the examples I showed before. Wolves are also Gothic. And one of the ways that we can talk about the Gothic aspects of wolves is how Edwin Burke reflects on them uh, in his work on the sublime and beautiful, which hopefully most of you have heard of. Um, it is, as the title suggests, thank you, Burke, it is about him talking about the sublime and the beautiful and the difference between the two. Um, and it's quite an early text from 1757. You can find it online in PDF form. And it's actually quite a readable text. I, I enjoy it. Um, and he talks about two things that I think connect with the idea of wolves as being related to the sublime, which can be both a a good or a bad thing, so they can be threatening and scary, um, but also they can be intrinsically beautiful. So he talks about how wolves have not more strength than several species of dogs, but on account of their unmanageable, unmanageable fierceness, the idea of a wolf is not despicable. So he's been saying that dogs are, they're very nice and we like dogs, but they're a bit cringing and so we find them despicable. In comparison, we can't control wolves. So whilst they are scary because they're unmanageable, at least they're not despicable like dogs, um, which I think is rather cruel to both the wolves and dogs. 
So it is not excluded from grand descriptions and similitudes. So you'd imagine you can see a wolf in a sublime setting, but you won't see a dog in a sublime setting. And he then talks about how the sublime in nature is found in the gloomy forests and in the howling wilderness. And I think that use of the adjective howling definitely refers back to the notion of wolves. And when we jump forward, of course, we now, if I said, describe a Gothic landscape, tell me everything that you can pick up on, you're going to hear the howling of wolves. They're very much the soundtrack of Gothic horror. Uh, and then this is a great picture I wanted to use where you can combine wolves um, and you can also combine dog. And this is a type of dog food. Uh, it's mini kibbles. It is the taste of Scandinavia. Um, and maybe Ali could like unpack what, what the taste of Scandinavia is. Pine trees, maybe, and glaciers. Um, and in this case, I think it's, it's moose and chicken and salmon. Um, and this is what you can give to your dog. So your dog can be a wolf of the wilderness. And it's just very, again, romanticized uh, use of description there and romanticized use of imagery there. Uh, and it, it made me laugh quite a lot. They had to you feed your dog this, and then they're going to get back to this natural state of being a wolf out in the wild, very cool of the wild. Elizabeth Parker, who, if you haven't read her work, The Forest and the Eco-Gothic, I really highly recommend it. Um, she talks about the monsters in the wilderness and the monsters in the forest. And she says this of wolves. To think of wolves as monsters is to think of the werewolf. And in many ways, that is my thesis statement. And that I would argue that if we think a werewolf is monstrous, because it turns into a wolf. What does that tell us about what we think about wolves? So where do we find the wolf in the werewolf? Or rather, why wolves? They are apex predators. Um, they're kind of a creature that whilst it may make us scared and uncomfortable, it is a good example of what could be called megafauna. Um, so it's an example of charismatic predators. Uh, similarly, the great white shark is a good example of that. A bear is another example. Tigers, lions. It is interestingly very much predators. And I think that in some ways reflects back to all sorts of things that were coming up in the discussion with Ali about meat eating, about being at the top of the hierarchy, about who's consuming who. who. They howl, which, as I mentioned, is part of this sort of gothic nature. Um, so there's something, an uncomfortable quality. Uh, and if you've never tried it before, like just sit and listen to recordings of wolves howling. And with the best will in the world, whilst it's hard to say, would I have this response if I didn't already have preconceived notions of wolves and howling? I think you will find that it does have a really intense response. Um, I used to play it to my children way before they'd read any books or anything like that. I've never sort of read them Little Red Riding Hood as it happens. And I used to play Wolf Howling to my children and watch their response. And this is when they were like a year, 18 months. And it was really interesting. Like their little faces just went, Whoa, where is it? Where's that noise coming from? So obviously there's something that was responding. Then there is Little Red Riding Hood, which is an archetypal example of, of the wolf as bad. And it is read to us at such a young age that I really think it would be impossible for us to separate the two. I went to go and see wolves at a park recently with my husband. Uh, I say recently, what is time? It would actually would have been about six years ago. Uh, so reasonably recently. And we were looking at um, some wolves, a pack of wolves um, where they were, they were in England. Um, and there was a woman with her child there. And the first thing she said was, look, it's the big bad wolf. Uh, at which point my husband grabbed me and went, do not say anything, move away, don't tell them about wolves or wolf biology, no one wants to hear this. Um, there is another aspect that I think is particularly interesting about wolves, is how we both feel ourselves to be like them and unlike them, and how we define ourselves through that. And that's picked up in the werewolf itself. Werewolves become a metaphor for the beast within, or that which we want to control, that which makes us non-human, that which makes us animalistic, the element that we want to control, the element that we believe we should have evolved out of. Um, and it's definitely important that a lot of the key werewolf texts, as it were, come through after we have Charles Darwin talking about evolution. 
So with wolves, we both see ourselves as like them because they are pack animals. Um, they are uh, they work together. Um, they also are capable of having quite complicated relationships within their packs. Um, they communicate. So there's a lot where we see ourselves like them, but also at the same time where we, we see ourselves as needing to define ourselves as not like them. So wolves are often defined through having an excessive uh, need to consume and to eat. And so we need to say, well, we're not like that. We have self-control. Um, there's a really um, interesting talk I went to once about domestication. And someone um, and the woman who was talking uh, put forward an idea that really we overlook the cuteness factor in most things when it comes to domestication of animals. Um, so her argument is that most likely when um, wolves were domesticated and became dogs, and I think at the moment the consensus is that's around 40,000 years ago, but there is a discussion. It moves from 40,000 to 20,000 years ago, um, but are we splitting hairs? Um, and she said that it's quite likely in her mind that what actually what happened is that this period of time wolves would have been eating um, or sharing kills they might come after a group of humans had killed an animal and they'd finish it off but also uh, she reckons that the toddlers were just looking at wolf pups and were like i want it's fluffy i want that and so they took in some wolf pups and that's how it happened and i love that idea um there's the wilderness, the relationship of the wolves with the wilderness. And whilst werewolves have increasingly started moving into urban areas, one of the key tropes that comes up uh, is this idea that the werewolf is a threat because it is something that is a symbol of the wilderness, the uncontrolled that is coming into an urban area. And alongside that is the notion of hunting wolves, both to control their population, their impact on farming and livestock. More recently, that's because there's a sense that wolves are getting too close to human habitation, but to hunt the wolf relates perfectly to the idea that we must kill the beast and we must kill the werewolf. So the two end up paralleling themselves there. I'm going to do a quick digression into eco-gothic or gothic nature. This is the most theoretical aspect. That is a goth in nature. I, I, I just wanted you, I thought that was a funny pun uh, and it amused me. So the first thing to say is you can use both terms reasonably interchangeably, I would say, don't worry too much. Um, the other thing to say is that eco-gothic is so new that how it is spelt and where you put the capital letters changes every five minutes. So in the time that I've been studying this, I've used hyphens in it, I've capitalized the G, E, I've capitalized the E, I've capitalized the E and the G. It's all very exciting. Here are some of the key ideas that are coming through. So first we have the idea of Gothic nature. That's a lovely Gothic backdrop. I hope you like that. That's quite a sort of, I'd say traditional first wave Gothic, late 1700s, early 1800s sort of backdrop, a bit ruined abbey in the wilderness. So this term comes from um, Hillard, Tom J. Hillard, and I have put it simply in my own words to mean a version of nature that appears to the human observer as existing outside rational understanding and scientific knowledge. That means we can't understand it, so we can't control it. And then we get scared. And what do you do if you can't control or understand something? Kill it. That is very important. It's the best, you, that's what you should always do. Um, and the essay is worth looking up. Now, Hillard builds on a term from Simon C. Estock, and that's ecophobia. And what he says is ecophobia is, as the name suggests, an irrational hatred or fear um, of the natural world. Um, so it's nature depicted as a hostile opponent, particularly regarding macroecological disasters, disasters such as global warming. So what does that mean in normal English? Well, when you read an article that's talking about like climate change or talking about hurricanes or talking about tornadoes, it's the desire to give it a name, like we literally name hurricanes, uh, but also a desire to sort of anthropomorphize nature and to give it an intention that it doesn't have. Nature is trying to destroy me, um, even though we know that uh, that's not true. It doesn't have a consciousness that we understand. And if we squish these together, um, we get the eco-Gothic. And I actually am using Shirai Deckard's term here. So if Gothic often turns around a return of the repressed that reveals buried social truths. So, um, you know, I did something bad in the past, it's coming back to haunt me. And that naughtiness is somehow framed through um, 
a political framework. So um, I actually think that the reason why England didn't do very well in the World Cup is because uh, really we were being haunted by all the people who had died building um, the various uh, things that needed to be required for the World Cup. And as a uh, previously colonial and still continuing colonial nation, I felt that that really affected our morale. That's That was my Gothic reading of the World Cup. The eco-Gothic turns around the uncanny manifestation of the environmental unconscious, particularly those forms of environmental violence that have been occulted. So essentially what it does is it says that the nature is coming back, it has been repressed, and it is in some ways going to get us. Um, and that's in part because of the history of violence that we've committed towards the environment. Now, what Decode points out is that eco-Gothic can be represented as a revolutionary or reactionary thing. So you can have your jaws, and jaws uh, is very much like big scary shark. Big scary shark is coming back to kill us. Ah! And actually the impact on the shark population was quite interesting. So that's just a classic reactionary, we need to kill the big scary shark, and then it comes back and commits revenge and you get all the sequels. Or it can be more critical. So it can be nature returning. And to some degree, um, we as the reader or viewer are meant to go, you've got a point. So something like that might be troll hunter or troll. Um, I'm also looking at trolls and the eco gothic and they are great examples. So they're very much like something is coming back. Uh, but actually, maybe we should reflect on what we did to nature and troll as a symbol of that. You can ask more about trolls another time. And asthma, um, I'm going to move now towards animals in this eco-Gothic framework. Stephen T. Asthma says animals are conceptualized in a continuum of strangeness. First, non-native species. So I've got Jura's rhinoceros picture there. So when you first come across the rhinoceros and you're like, oh, unicorns are real. And then familiar beasts with unfamiliar sizes or modified parts. So that's a giant snake. So that would be like the film Anaconda, which is great. Definitely go and watch it if you like terrible B movies. Then hybrids of surprising combinations. And I've got a picture of a griffin there. So that's different aspects when I put together. And finally, at the further margin, shapeshifters and indescribable creatures. Um, so I've got a picture of a selkie there. That's another shapeshifter. Now, of course, what we find with wolves, uh, with werewolves, is that they're very much in the aspect of hybridity, in that they are both wolf and they are human. So Gutenberg talks about uh, the fact that werewolves against the contemporary cultural background of revised notions of the body and the subject, namely as permeable, instable and performative, the werewolf assumes special significance as a destabilizer of fixed identities. So again, in layman English, werewolves are real scary because they tell us that what we think of fixed identities and categories like wolf and human are absolutely not the case. And that seems pretty obvious, given what we just talked about in terms of what is a wolf. Well, it's about three billion th things. It does not have a fixed or stable identity because of how we use it. But we definitely like it if nature can just really keep in nice categories. So why the duckbill platypus cause so many issues. The other thing is we then have, and what I think is particularly interesting is we actually have that, that notion of the werewolf and hybridity is being mirrored in fears around wolves and hybridity. So what you, you may be aware of is that wolves will mate with domestic dogs as well, and you get wolf dogs. And there's an appalling trend online where you can buy wolf dogs. I would not recommend that at all. It's not a good idea. It's not nice for anyone involved. Um, generally, dogs and wolves don't breed, but that's in part because of the changing paradigms of the environment. Wolves and dogs are more likely to come into contact with each other. You can also get koi dogs, so coyotes and dogs, and that's another thing that causes issues. Um, and what Figari and Skogan say in Social Representations of the Wolf, um, and this is from a really big book about wolf biology, if you're interested, I highly recommend it. Um, they say that wolf hybrids challenge the boundaries between the wild and humanized, between wildlife and domestic animals. And it is likely that the mere existence of wolf hybrids creates confusion, reminding us of the socially constructed nature of the concept of species. So nice and easy. We use the term species, we think that it's nice, clear, discrete boundaries, but actually when you find out that animals can breed, and of course one of the ways that we define species is like it can 
it breeds within itself, it doesn't breed with other species, then it challenges that. This also supports my notion that dogs are werewolves, because the closest thing we have to an animal that is between humans and wolves is, of course, dogs. So if you're wondering, do werewolves exist? Yes, they're called dogs and you may own one. And in fact, we've seen a dog. So yes, it's a tiny little werewolf in your house. So let's get back to text. I've given you quite a lot of theory here and hopefully you found that interesting. But what I'd also like to do is maybe go, well, how do we apply that? So I've asked lots of questions and I've come up with answers to these questions and then I've mushed things together to start creating an eco-gothic reading of the werewolf concentrating on wolves. So what I wanted to do was find a text that I think really um, is kind of like a blueprint for that. So I chose Dracula, or as I like to think of it, a werewolf in vampire's clothing. Um, and you can, I have, I am quoting myself here, you, you can find that. I think it's a really good chapter uh, and I think it's a really original take on Dracula. I would say that, but I, I think it is interesting. So we're all conscious of the presence of wolves in Dracula and indeed pretty much every single one of the adaptations onto the screen of Dracula have a moment where we have the famous line, listen to them, children of the night, what music they make. So we do associate the count with the wolf. What we perhaps don't do is realize how much um, Stoker was influenced by werewolves. One of his sources was Sabine Baring Gould's The Book of Werewolves from 1865. And the language that he uses in Dracula is often language that he's taken either from Baring Gould or from Emily Gerard's The Land Beyond the Forest. And in both cases, these texts, um, which aren't great in that, like Baring Gould's and, and Gerard's sex are really fun to read, uh, but from an anthropological um, point of view or just generally not being racist or xenophobic point of view, they're not great, but they do tend to conflate the two aspects. Um, and a lot of the physical aspects of Dracula, uh, like his monobrow um, and like his elongated ring finger um, and his hairy palms, these are actually related to werewolves as opposed to vampires. And of course he can turn into a wolf and generally, one of the key defining features of a werewolf, like we discussed on that very first slide, is you turn into a wolf. So I would say that as a symbol of gothic nature, Dracula's lupine hybridity, he turns into a wolf, represents a dual threat. His uncanny arrival in the, uh, in the form of the wolf predicts the fall of the British landscape to a wilderness state. I used uncanny really specifically there. I did mean it in the Freudian sense. In that, Wolves were once native to the British Isles, so they are recognisable, and they come back with Dracula, so it, but in a scary, monstrous form. So they are a thing that we once knew coming back in a way that we don't quite recognise. So I was being quite theoretical there. So it predicts the fall of the British landscape to a wilderness state, whilst his attack on Lucy threatens to transform the human subject into a savage state. So the arrival of Dracula as a wolf is both, oh God, we're going to stop being a civilized nation and we're going to start being scared that perhaps things are getting bad. You know, it's the end of the 1800s. We're starting to see things changing. But also, oh wow, how quickly can humans themselves become violent and animalistic? And I think, again, we, we've got a little bit of Darwin there, a bit of the fear, not only of, of that we are related to animals, but then to also think about things like degeneration. Could we turn back into a monstrous or animalistic state? So for me, Dracula sets up the blueprint of why we're scared of werewolves in terms of their relationship to the wilderness and the wolf, but also why we then have to have a narrative where the beast must die. But in the early 20th century, of course, we start getting changes in our approaches to wolves and what we think about wolves. And that itself is then reflected in werewolf literature. So I've used the term the green wolf here, and that is um, in reference to um, Aldo Leopold, who was an early environmentalist. Um, so first half of the 20th century, I'm getting my dates right. And he was very much of the opinion, he was an American, and he was very much of the opinion that if you wanted to make um, wilderness spaces safe, you absolutely had to go in and kill every wolf that you could see. And one day he killed a female wolf and her cubs were uh, in the den nearby. And he had this like 
moment of insight, whereas he watched and he talks at the green light, the green fire in her eyes going out, he realized he'd been wrong. And he started saying, no, we need to have wolves in parks. And he actually then started saying, we need them to control the deer population. So I've got some wolf eyes to show you that. So again, I am uh, quoting myself again. Um, I do write about this stuff quite a lot, in which I say, um, alongside Sam George, who was my PhD supervisor, um, this ancient enemy has been rehabilitated and reappraised, so the wolf, and rewilding projects have attempted to admit wolves more closely into our lives. Their reintroduction has been seen as a symbolic process of atonement for the sins of the destruction of wild environments, while my typos are building up, and the eradication of species due to human wrongdoing. In the 21st century, an era of late capitalism, new werewolf myths have emerged from our cultural memories around humans and wolves. And thus we have more and more sympathetic werewolves. So Stryber um, wrote, Whitley Stryber wrote, The Wild and Wolfen. And whilst the Wolfen does still show these creatures as monstrous, it allows and admits the idea that they do have a certain right to live, in part from focalizing aspects of the novel through that point of view. The Wild is very much a like slightly hippie, dippy, psychedelic, it's great text that's all about a guy who like turns into a wolf because he looks into a wolf's eyes at the zoo. Um, and I think it's great. Um, we also then start reappraising the idea of the sympathetic werewolf with characters like Oz from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, Shakira goes ahead and just, I'll be honest with you, she just sure as hell reclaims ooh, everything about um scary werewolves by really making them a symbol of not male sexual violence but female sexual empowerment um, and I also love the fact that in She-Wolf if you go back and watch it she's got very pale blonde hair and she wears a lot of uh, like pale colors and if you look at really early female werewolves like Clements Hausman's The Werewolf, The White Wolf, Hearts Mountain, The White Wolf of Construction. It seems to be this thing where female werewolves often have white pelts. So I think she, she'd done quite a lot of research and that's where she got it from. Um, and then finally, we also have like Scott McCall from Teen Wolf. Now, whilst these are very disparate, different examples, what it does show is an overall movement. And I think, you know, we see this with the sympathetic vampire as well, a movement away from uncritically assuming the monstrosity of the werewolf and perhaps starting to think how we can reclaim the other. In some examples, this is very gr uh, graphically related to environmentalism. And I think Stryber is really a good example of this. Um, but also just that we start seeing discussion within werewolf texts about wolves themselves and what they're really like, as it were. So I'll finish with this, werewolf conservation. So Glenn Duncan says, and this is from his series of texts, The Last Werewolf, um, so it's actually from the first text, The Last Werewolf, and if you haven't, I really recommend reading it. He says that monsters die out when the collective imagination no longer needs them. So this may seem to mean that as we perhaps start challenging our perception of wolves and our relationship with wolves, well, then we don't really need werewolves anymore. But I'd argue we absolutely need werewolves. One, there's no reason why werewolves can't carry on being monstrous. I don't want to get to the point where we're putting, you know, we're saying that they're magical, brilliant creatures um, and we're completely denying the fun of the monstrous werewolf. Ginger Snaps is one of my favourites. But perhaps that we're more critically engaging with what makes them monstrous and the simplistic not, um, approach of killing the monster. So I'd argue that werewolves play an important part in wolf conservation because they are reminding us that we need to rewild our imagination in many ways before we actually end up rewilding the world. And I'll leave that there.